Hey, welcome to another video from Skinny Medic. Are you confused the difference between a trauma kit and a hemorrhage control kit? Are you looking to build your own? Well, I'm gonna talk about it in this video. All right, so let's start off with the hemorrhage control kits. These kits are just designed to stop major bleeding. That's it. They don't take care of any kind of respiratory or breathing problems, anything like that. It's just to stop major bleeding. So I'm gonna show you some components that you need to look at and show you a couple examples that I have. So the couple examples that I have are say this one right here, which is part of my EDC trauma kit, which has a SWAT T tourniquet, pressure bandage, some gauze. This one here is my Skinny Medic pocket kit. It has a tourniquet, a pressure bandage, gauze, and then a pair of gloves. So you can kind of see some of the same components in the same kits. So I'm gonna show you some components that you need to look at to make up a hemorrhage control kit. So the first component I want to look at with a hemorrhage control kit is a tourniquet. There are plenty of tourniquets on the market and everyone has an opinion on which one is the best. So pick one. It doesn't have to be just a soft T, the TK4, the CAT, RATS, SWAT T, whichever one you want to choose, pick it and then get some training with it. Know how to use it, know how to apply it to your arm, know how to apply it to your leg. It's probably a good idea to have more than one tourniquet with you. I normally keep one tourniquet in my pocket or on my belt, and then I have one that's in my trauma kit. So uh, it's probably good to have a couple of tourniquets, but there's plenty on the market. I've done videos on each and every one of these tourniquets, so you can look at my channel and find them. So the next thing you're going to see that these kits have in common is a pressure bandage. So there, there once again, there are plenty of pressure bandages on the market. So find one that you like and go with it. You know, this is the one that's made by North American. This is an Israeli bandage. This is an Olay's bandage made by TACMED Solutions. This is a cool one. I haven't done a video on it yet, but I've got it. I've got to do a video for it. First Care. There again, plenty of pressure bandages. They all do the same thing. They all have a little bit of difference in them, but you need a pressure bandage in there. So the next thing is obviously you're going to need some kind of gauze. So whether you have a gauze that has non-hemostatic agent, it's compressed gauze, roll a cling, or 5x9, you're going to need something to absorb the bleeding since you're building a hemorrhage control kit. You can look at some hemostatic agents. This is a Celox with applicator. You've got combat gauze. Now just as a side note here, uh, there's no difference now between the green and the black package. used to be the black package did not have the uh, x-ray strip in it but now there's no difference between the black and the green packaging so it doesn't matter and then we've got the Celox this is the 15 powder here and then the gauze here so if you've got some extra money you can spend then go with a hemostatic agent but at the very least you need some gauze here so one of the things I did not include in the EDC kit that I do carry in my pocket kit is the gloves. This is one of the things that, yeah, they probably are important. Are they the most important item? No, but they obviously are important uh, for keeping uh, infection control down, things like that. Now, generally, the people I shoot with at the range, I'm really good friends with, and if something really, really bad happened to them, I wouldn't be so worried about putting gloves on. But on the ambulance, other scenarios, absolutely. I would try to put gloves on. I'm gonna put gloves on, personal protection equipment, things like that. But that's something else you can look at adding. So those are the things you can look at for your hemorrhage control kit. All right, so these are the different components that I brought out and showed you for the hemorrhage control. These are all designed to stop major bleeding. The tourniquet, the pressure bandages, the galls. They have no other purpose but to stop major bleeding. So our trauma kit is going to build on top of this foundation from here. There again, the same thing with the trauma kit. You want to build a control major bleeding, but then we can kind of move into the airway and breathing kind of things there. So uh, we're going to talk about some more things you can add to your trauma kits here. But starting from this foundation, from this point forward, obviously we're going to look at some airway breathing, some heat loss prevention, things like that. So once you have the bleeding control section of your trauma kit built, then let's look at some chest seals. Whether you want to go with non-vented chest seals or vented chest seals, Halo does make vented chest seals as well, so I just don't have an example of it to lay out here for you. But chest seals, I recommend getting two, okay? So you can get entry and exit wounds covered, 
vented, non-vented, that's a whole other story. But get some good chest seals that are going to work for you in an emergency situation. Two other items that you can look at adding to your trauma kit would be an MPA. This is going to protect someone's airway that is not conscious. Their tongue has fallen back onto the throat. This inserts. Does not hit the gag reflex. Protects the airway. Another thing you can look at adding to your trauma kit, if you have the training, the knowledge, the availability, is to add a needle or two to your trauma kit. This is a pull to compression needle. This is going to relieve a tension pneumothorax, which is life-threatening, but this takes training, okay? I'm going to throw that caution out there big time, okay? Now, if you screw this up, you can be held liable. You can get into a lot of trouble, so make sure you have the training and you have, you're legally allowed to carry this. But that's an advanced skill but it would relieve attention pneumothorax in a life-threatening scenario. So one of the things that people often leave out of their trauma kits is shears, scissors, uh, some way of getting the clothes off of the patient because if you can't see the trauma, you can't fix it. So you have to have ability to expose your patient. Using your regular pocket knife could be dangerous. Okay, You could end up causing more injuries. So I keep a pair of EMT shears. I've also got the Benchmade hook that works really well. So some way of exposing the patient, pulling their uh, shirt, cutting the shirt, cutting their pants legs, things like that. One of the things people often forget about is heat loss. Once your body goes into shock, the core temperature starts to lower down, causing organ failure, organ death, which could ultimately lead to your patient dying or you dying. So having an emergency blanket, mylar blanket, space blanket, whatever you want to call it, in your kit to prevent heat loss is important. So now I've got all the items laid on the table. It kind of give you a good idea of what you can look at. So you have the tourniquets, you've got pressure bandages, the gauze here, chest seals, NPA, you've got the pull decompression needle, the mylar blanket, and then Benchmade hook here, and then a pair of shears. Now I didn't include like an occlusive dressing, but you can use the plastic. You can make, you know, I've showed occlusive dressings before, things like that, making the chest seal. So kind of gives you some ideas, some different components. If you're looking to build a hemorrhage control kit or you're looking to build your own trauma kit. So one of the things you'll notice I did not include in my trauma kit or my hemorrhage control kit was sutures. Okay, sutures do not have any space for first response care. Okay, you have time afterwards to get sutures done to take care of for infection, for cosmetic, all that reason. Okay. But for your first response, you do not need sutures. They have their place in survival medicine, wilderness medicine, absolutely. Totally agree with you guys. But as far as the first response, the initial response to any of this that I've mentioned, you don't need sutures, okay? Sutures are there for to prevent infection, for cosmetic reasons, things like that. But we can take care of that in long-term care, okay? But you don't need them to stop major bleeding, you don't need them for anything like that. So you can have them. Absolutely. They go in your first first aid kit, your general first aid kit, your at-home kit, things like that. But they don't need to be in your trauma kit. It's just taking up space and makes your kit way more. And I hope this video helps. You never know when you'll be the first responder. Remember the right gear and the right training. And remember, if you want to support this channel, go to shop.skinnymedic.com and look at my pre-made kits and supplies. And look how nice everything fits in the new skinny medic pouch, by the way. Just do a little advertisement from me. But this would make a great trauma kit, great first aid kit. Okay, I'm done trying to sell it to you guys. Hey, welcome to another video from Skinny Medic. Are you curious between the difference between... Hey, welcome to another video from Skinny Medic. Are you curious between the difference between... Hey, welcome to another video from Skinny Medic. Do you want another different... Hey, welcome to another video from Skinny Medic. Do you want to know the difference? I can't say difference. Good gosh. 
Hey, welcome to another video from Skinny Medic. Do you want to know the difference between a... That stupid tractor is going to kill me. 